stop. All right, I'm going to minus. Always wait for the little, there we go. Well, hello to folks that may be tuning in later. Um, hello, Joanne in Japan and Lisa in Missouri, Bill and Lorraine in Canada, and David and Marlene in Spain, Pauline in London. Hello to everyone. And, uh, and hello to those of you who are eating breakfast right now. Uh, so uh, it's good to have everybody here today. I wanted to take a couple of Sundays and talk about uh, the power of praise and thanksgiving. Uh, and we're, we're going to start in December uh, a study of the Gospel of Matthew, Lord willing. But I wanted to just take a couple of weeks to talk about the power of giving thanks, the power of praise. And we want to begin today by talking about entering the presence of God through thanksgiving and praise. In Psalm 100 and Psalm 95, or a couple of psalms we'll be referring to, uh, we remember from our Genesis study that God walked in the Garden of Eden. It sounds as though Adam and Eve were accustomed to being in God's presence uh, in their sinless state. They were accustomed to being in the presence of God. In eternity, we will abide in the presence of God forever. Uh, Revelation chapter 7, we read this recently. He will spread his tabernacle over us. He'll spread his dwelling over us. And even now, Paul says that we're the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So God wants us to, he created us to enjoy his presence. We were created to enjoy the creator of the universe. In fact, the old uh, catechism, uh, the Westminster Catechism says, the chief end of man is to know God and enjoy him forever. What a wonderful thought that is. That's why we were created to know God and enjoy him. So God wants us to learn how to enter in and enjoy his presence. And Psalm 100 provides a picture of this. Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful singing. Know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name for the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting and his faithfulness to all generations. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. That's the way I'm sure Lynn has taught on this for over 25 years. Every retreat I've ever been to and every conference I've been to, she teaches on praise words. And the word for thanksgiving is tauda. It means to extend the hands in adoration. It's from the word yada, Y-A-D-A-H which means to boast or celebrate with the lifting of the hands. And I've heard Lynn teach on that many times and, and then people act it out uh, with, their, with movement and dance. Enter his gates with tauda, thanksgiving, and his courts with praise. That's the word tehila. Again, a common word in Lynn's conferences. Tehila is a hymn of praise from halal, which means to boast or praise, to boast of the Lord, to praise him. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. A sure way into the presence of God, thanksgiving and praise. And we have such a, a, a wonderful picture of that in the Old Testament tabernacle. The tabernacle provides us with a physical, a physical picture of the spiritual process of entering into the presence of God. You remember when the Hebrew people were traveling through the wilderness, their center of worship was a tent which they folded up and carried with them as they traveled. It was called the tabernacle, which means dwelling. The Lord manifested his glory there in the tabernacle. He covered Israel with a cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night. But in the tabernacle, the Lord manifested his glory in a special way. It was the Lord's way of saying, I'm among you. I dwell in your midst. The cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night, and in a most special way, the tabernacle was the visible proof of God's presence among them. When they camped, they set up the tabernacle. It was, it was surrounded on the outside by a fence of curtains. Inside was a courtyard that was the outer court, 
and then the tabernacle itself. Now, here's what's cool about it. The tribes of Israel camped around the tabernacle complex. Judah camped on the east side. There was only one entrance. It was on the east. To come to the entrance, to, to pass through into the outer court of the tabernacle, you needed to pass through Judah. The word Judah, Yehuda, means celebration and is derived from one of the Hebrew words for praise, yada, to lift up the hands in praise. The only entrance to the courtyard of the tabernacle was through Judah, celebration. Now, you know the Lord did that intentionally. He said, uh, enter my gates with thanksgiving and my courts with praise. If you want to get through the east gate, the only gate, the only entrance, you have to pass through praise. That's just, the Lord teaches us things so clearly. Now, uh, there was a limited, once you came in, anybody could come in to the, to the uh, outer court, through the east gate into the outer court. But there was a limited entrance after that. After that was the holy place and in the holy of holies. Uh, and, and, and just inside the outer court was the altar of sacrifice or the altar of burnt offering where the people brought their sacrifices and their offerings. But the people could, put, could go no further. They could come into the outer court, bring their sacrifices to the altar of sacrifice, but that was it. The only people who could enter the tabernacle, who could go on into the holy place and then the holy of holies, only, only the priests, Aaron and his sons. Now, that wasn't God's original plan. In Exodus chapter 19, he said, uh, now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Originally, God wanted an entire nation of priests, but this was conditional on the people remaining holy. They didn't, and so God established a limited priesthood of Aaron and his sons. Only Aaron and his sons could go past the altar of sacrifice and minister in the tabernacle as priests. But even Aaron and his sons had certain rituals they had to go through or they would have been disqualified. So, the qualifying of the priests is in Exodus 29 and Exodus 30. First of all, there was the altar of sacrifice. Uh, Aaron and his sons had to pay a ransom for their sins, uh, a sacrifice, a sin offering with the blood of the atoning sacrifice applied to the altar and to the priests. And chapter 30 also describes a yearly sacrifice, uh, that yearly sacrifice, a a, not just a regular sacrifice, but a yearly sacrifice for the priests and all the people. In addition, they had to pay a half shekel every year as a ransom, a ransom offering that was called atonement money. And that's in chapter 30. Now, why was the Lord requiring a sacrifice and, and money, a ransom, to teach them the seriousness of sin? The blood of the atonement was a confession of sin and a recognition of the penalty of sin. What, happens when, what happened when sin came into the world? Death came into the world. And so the blood atonement was a recognition of the penalty of sin, death. Also, the atonement money taught them that sin brings about slavery, and the slave has to be purchased out of bondage. Now, the sacrifice, the blood sacrifice and the money didn't remove their sin, in Hebrews chapter 10, it says it was not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. The sacrifices covered their sin, secured God's forgiveness, and God passed over their sin in anticipation of Jesus' sacrifice centuries later. But the priest had to submit to this, blood sacrifice, atonement money, and if they hadn't, they would have been disqualified. Now, they passed on past the altar of sacrifice, and then they came to the laver of washing. That's also in Exodus chapter 30. Before the priest could enter the tabernacle, the holy place, the, the presence of the Lord, they had to wash their hands and their feet. That, that The laver of washing reminded them of the defilement, uh, of the uncleanness that interrupts communion with the holy God. So they went past the altar of sacrifice, then the, the laver of washing, and, but then they had to be anointed, again, Exodus chapter 30. 
Before they entered in to minister to the Lord, they needed to be anointed. Oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. The anointing speaks of the inward work. The outward oil speaks of the inward work of the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> preparing us to fellowship with God. Only as a priest yielded to the Holy Spirit could he stand before the Lord and minister. In any attempt to imitate or counterfeit the anointing oil or apply it to a non-priest resulted in death. So in all of this, God was saying, I'm dwelling in your midst because I want to have fellowship with you. But if you want to experience my presence, then you have to take seriously that which has separated you from me. And you have to follow the pattern for correcting the separation, the uh, altar of sacrifice, the labor of washing, the anointing. God says, I want to have fellowship with you. But you have to take seriously what separated you from me and follow my pattern for correcting the separation. Now, that was the Old Testament reality. In the New Testament reality, God still desires fellowship with his people, but we live under a new covenant. Under this covenant, all believers are priests. Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 2, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's possession so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now, if, 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 you, if you were thinking, boy, 1 Peter chapter 2 sounds very similar to Exodus 19. Well, it is. That, that's because that was God's original purpose, to have a kingdom of priests. Now, he couldn't do it under the old covenant because the people disqualified themselves uh, through continued sin. But we're under a new covenant, and it's a better covenant because in Hebrews chapter 8, we read it's based on better promises. Uh, and those promises are that the law of God is written inwardly in our hearts and not on a tablet of stone. Uh, it's a better covenant because we know God in a personal way, as opposed to knowing him through a system of mediators, uh, sacrifices, and rituals. It's a better covenant because it's a covenant of grace and mercy as opposed to a covenant uh, through works of the law, which nobody could keep. It's a better covenant because it's based on better promises. It's based on a better sacrifice. Our sacrifice was offered in the heavenly tabernacle. It was one sacrifice for all time. Uh, it was an all-sufficient sacrifice, the blood of Jesus. It's a better covenant because it's better promises, better sacrifice, and we have a better high priest innocent, undefiled, eternal. So uh, we're under a new covenant. It's a better covenant. And we're a kingdom of priests. And we've been qualified to enter the holy place and the holy of holies. And that's why in Hebrews chapter 10, it says, let us therefore draw near. And in Hebrews chapter 4, it says, we should enter boldly. Let us therefore draw near with confidence to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Uh, let me read from Hebrews chapter 10, beginning with verse 18. Uh, there, well, beginning verse 19. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near, draw near where? Into the holy of holies with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. And then in chapter four, it says, let us therefore draw near with confidence, with boldness, where? Into the holy of holies, into the holy of place, and through the holy place, into the holy of holies. God wants us to draw near. He's done everything he can to be close to us. We, he wants us now to enter in with bold confidence to the holy place and the holy of holies. And we have been qualified as priests to do this. Now, first of all, we pass through the gates, uh, into the outer court, how? Through praise. And I love Psalm 95, just a, a one page to the left there. Oh, come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with praise. So we pass through the east gate 
into the outer court with, with just with our praise and our thanks. But we don't stop at the altar of sacrifice. We've been qualified to pass through the altar of sacrifice. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 10, again, by this will we've been sanctified through the holy off through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices. Why does he have to do it over and over? Because the, the, the priest continues to sin. So he stands daily offering sacrifices which can never take away sins. They only covered the sins. But he, Jesus, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God. For by one offering, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. What a verse. What a truth. For, uh, for, for by one offering, he's perfected a kingdom of priests for all time. Therefore, brethren, as we just read, since we have confidence, there, why do we have confidence? Because one sacrifice, good for all believers for all time, has qualified us to pass through, pass the altar of sacrifice. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere, draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So we don't stop at the altar of sacrifice. We are the priests who have been qualified to pass through, but we don't have to stop at the labor of washing. Yes, there's continual defilement of sin, and we do need to be washed daily, but we don't need that labor of washing because we have something better. Jesus said to, to Simon Peter, Simon said, oh, you're not going to wash my feet. Jesus said, uh, he who is bathed, he said, if I don't wash you, you have nothing to do with me. He who is bathed, and then Jesus said, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet. We've been bathed once at the altar in the blood of Jesus. There's a fountain filled with blood uh, flowing from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunge beneath that flood, uh, lose all their guilty stains. B but there's a daily defilement, but we're being washed every day by the washing of the word applied by the Holy Spirit, who rises up in us like streams of living water. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. That's the Holy Spirit who leads us into truth. And when we sin, the Holy Spirit will show us. And as we accept accountability, we confess and we receive the washing that God offers. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Cleanse, cleanse. Cleanse means the sin no longer exists as a reality separating us from God. If I could say this 30 times in a row, Cleansed means the sin no longer exists as a reality separating us from God. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Have you ever been working out in the yard? I mean, here I am talking to ladies. When I, when I work in the yard, my, I'll, I'll have dirt all over me, but especially on my hands. If my hand has been cleansed, so what do I do? I wash my hands. If my hand has been cleansed of dirt, the dirt is no longer there. I say, well, that, that's pretty obvious, Will. But, <laughs> but think about it. If, I've been, if my hand has been cleansed of dirt, where is the dirt? It's not there. So if, if John says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from what? From, all, from some, no, from all unrighteousness. That means it's no longer there. Cleanse means the sin no longer exists as a reality separating us from God. So we pass through the gates of praise and thanksgiving, pass through the outer court, past the altar of sacrifice, because there's one sacrifice for all time. We pass through the labor of washing, because that's being done every day as we are honest and accountable before God. Oh, and then, but then there's, there's also... Uh, and anointing, the priests had to be anointed by oil. But, uh, oh, but before we talk about the anointing, remember this, God is not impressed 
by old covenant breast beating from new covenant people who deny the power of the blood of Jesus and the daily washing of the word through confession and repentance and therefore fail to enter the holy place. God wants us in the holy place daily because he loves us, because he wants us to be with him. Jesus, here's Jesus a few hours before the cross saying, Father, I want them to be with me where I am. Here he is facing the cross and he's talking to the Father about, I want them to be with me. The Lord wants, so he's, God's not impressed by people who stand outside and say, oh, I'm unworthy to enter in. I can't enter in. No, God's not impressed by that. He wants us to, because what's that, what are we doing when we say, I can't enter in, I can't have fellowship with God? We're denying the power of the blood of Jesus. We're denying the daily washing of the word through confession and repentance, and therefore failing to enter the holy place. God's not impressed by that. He's impressed by people who pass through into the holy place. But before the old covenant priests could enter to minister before the Lord, they needed to be anointed. But we carry the anointing with us. John said, 1 John chapter 2, and as for you, the anointing which you receive from him abides in you. You're carrying the oil in you. Wherever you go, you say, well, I need more anointing. It's in you. You carry it with you. So we enter the gates with thanksgiving, and we don't stop in the courtyard. Rather, we enter that we pass through the altar of sacrifice, because one sacrifice for all time. We pass through the labor of washing, because it's going on every day. And if something's been washed, then it no longer exists as a reality separating us from God. We carry the, anoint the anointing with us. We enter the holy place into the holy of holies. And we enter the holy place giving thanks and praise, boasting. I think that's such, such a, a cool definition of that word, boasting of the great things God has done. And it's interesting that Psalm 95 seems to indicate that. Let's start over again, verse 1. Oh, come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms coming through the east gate. Now, as they begin to enter, they pass through the altar of sacrifice, labor of washing. Now, they're, it's like they're stopping to boast of the great things of God. For the Lord is a great God. And a great king above all gods, in whose hand are the depths of the earth, the peaks of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for it was he who made it, and his hands formed the dry land. So it's as if, it's as if they, they, they're, they're coming now into the holy place and boasting, giving thanks. And so do we. We give thanks for an altar of sacrifice called Mount Calvary. We give thanks for rivers of living water and a fresh anointing that abides within the priest. And so now we've moved through the holy place, past the altar of incense. And, and what is the altar of incense? It, it's, it's our praise rising to the Father. And we move through the veil into the holy of holies. Notice the change that happens here. Verse 6, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Now they're, they're bowing. They're, they came in with thanksgiving and praise. They paused to remember the great things. Now it's like they've entered the holy of holies, bowing and kneeling. Well, what was inside the holy of holies? Uh, can anybody uh, remember that? What was inside the holy of holies? Wasn't that the Ark of the Covenant? Yeah, yeah. The mercy seat. Mercy seat. The mercy seat. And under the mercy seat, well, first of all, let's talk about the mercy seat. The mercy seat. God has said that he would meet with Moses there at the mercy seat. So what is the mercy seat? It's a place of fellowship where we meet God. We were saved so that we could come back into fellowship with God. In eternity, we will have uninterrupted, uninterrupted fellowship with God. If we're too busy for the reason we were saved, then we're too busy. Think about that. Well, I've been too. If you're too busy for the reason we were saved, then that's too busy. Uh, uh, so at the mercy seat, we fellowship with the God who has lavished his mercy upon us. The God who is rich in mercy, who abundantly pardons. God wants us to come boldly so that we can obtain mercy. 
And what mercies are there? It says, come boldly before the throne of grace that you may find mercy and grace to help in time of need. Well, what mercies are there beneath the mercy seat? Well, as Lynn said, the Ark of the Covenant. Hmm. That was a wooden box. What was in the Ark of the Covenant? First of all, the Ten Commandments. Uh, what, what were the Ten Commandments? God's revelation to the people. Where do you find fresh revelation? In the Holy of Holies. <clears throat> uh, now, in or in front of the ark was Aaron's rod that had budded, the rod that had been used to break Pharaoh's power. Jesus said, you shall have authority to trample upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Where do we appropriate, where do we take hold of the rod of that authority? In the Holy of Holies. So what's in the Holy of Holies? Uh, the mercy seat, where we celebrate the mercy of God, under the mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant, where we find revelation and we find authority. What else was there in the uh, Ark of the Covenant? A pot of manna, which represents fresh provision from God. Jesus said, and we read this a few months ago in Revelation chapter two, two, to him who overcomes, to him I will give some of the hidden manna. Now, I, I, hidden manna. It's hidden, but God is not hiding it. <laughs> I think that's cool. To, to him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna. It's hidden, but God's not hiding it. It's stored up in the Holy of Holies. God stored it up there so that it won't be stolen or corrupted. It's hidden, but God's not hiding it. He stored it there so that it won't be stolen or corrupted. And who enters? Those who overcome. Those who overcome, Jesus said to him who overcomes, I'll give some of the hidden men. Uh, overcome what? Bondage, sin, offense, busy schedules. Those who overcome, and name anything else, fill out the list. Those who are anxiety, worry, those who overcome find that the manna is not hidden, but stored up and ready to be released. We need fresh revelation to reach our generation. A, flesh, a fresh flow of authority and fresh manna, provision. Where is that? In the Holy of Holies. Now, churches have tried to enter into the Holy of Holies with strange incense, uh, praise that focuses on my guilt or my fallenness, praise that tickles my fancy but doesn't focus on God. Under the Old Covenant, strange incense was punishable by death. Under the New Covenant, well, we don't die. We just don't get in. <laughs> if, it's, if We don't get in. And so the ministry ends up, uh, or the plans that God has for us end up dying. We don't die. The ministry dies, or the church dies. There are always good religious reasons to stay in the outer, co outer court. Oh, who am I to press into the holy place? Who am I to press into the holy of holy? But th th that's just not valid. God's not impressed by that. There's one wonderful reason to press in to the holy place and in the holy of holies because that's where god meets us at his mercy seat and there in god's presence is all the revelation the authority and the provision that we need to fulfill his purpose in our generation through the ministries that he's given us let's press on into the presence of god press on into the holy of holies through thanksgiving and praise so, and it, Lynn, you've been teaching on this at conferences since, since I was a boy, so <laughs> for almost 30 years. And I know Rosemary and Susie have heard this many times. And those of you who are listening later, uh, Pauline, David, Marlene, Lisa, uh, Bill and Lorraine, Joanne, whoever else is tuning in later, God bless you. And I hope that that's, this is valid to you. You've heard it many times in Lynn's conferences and retreats, but, uh, but isn't that a wonderful thought that we're qualified to press in and God wants us to press in. He's not, he's not impressed by people that say, well, who am I to press into the Holy of Holy? We're, we're priests qualified to press in. And isn't that a cool thought that if you wash something off your hands, it's no longer there. And that which we have been washed of no longer exists as a reality separating us from that's how god could say i will throw your sin as far as the east is from the west is infinite infinite 
or when God says, I will, I will forgive your sin and remember it no more. How can a God who knows all truth not remember something? By an intentional act of his will, puts it away as a reality. See, uh, kind of conversely, I used to re wonder, well, how can God be present in all places and hell is that place of exclusion from God? Uh, <clears throat> because because uh, it's an ex it's those in hell are those who chose to live separated from God and they live forever relationally separated from God. Uh, in, in the same sense, sin is no longer present as a reality separating us from relationship with the Lord God if, if it's been washed. So anyway, the power of giving thanks, the power of thanksgiving, we enter into the presence of God. I hope we will all take time this week for special times, but not just this week, but the regularly, daily, day by day, we enter into his, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. So are there any comments or questions on that from people who've been doing this for decades? <laughs> like this was like, this is something you never thought about. You've been doing this for, for uh, years and years and years. That's what your ministry is. Here I'm talking to people whose ministry is <laughs> praise and thanksgiving. But anyway, uh, but any thoughts? Yours is, is so rich. This is such a rich teaching. You know, I, I just go over some of the Hebrew and Greek and English words that relate to movement found in the word and their scriptures. We just act out the scriptures, but this is a rich teaching. <laughs> so this would be cool. cool sometime, Lynn, to have a retreat on... Uh, um, uh, Praise the, and worship? Just the, huh? Praise and worship? Yeah, well, yeah, but, but especially the priesthood qualified to enter, you know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, qualified to come in. That's a, what a cool thought that, that the altar of sacrifice, that's been done for all time. And that the labor of washing is an ongoing process so that we're not disqualified. The anointing, oh, you brought that with you. Mm -hmm. Isn't that cool? You brought it with you. It abides in you, John said. Mm -hmm. So everything that those old priests wanted, had to do, uh, has, been, has been done. Mm -hmm. So it's an ongoing reality. That would be a good conference. Yeah. You know, about the holy of entering and take me past the outer courts and through the holy place, yeah, past yeah. the brazen altar. And I want to see your face. I mean, I could just see all kinds of activations for that. I mean, there's only anyway. about 400 songs yeah. uh, that, that could be drawn from for that. Oh, uh, yeah. for, uh, yeah. the, and, and really think of the empowerment of spending two and a half days on that, uh, of, of saying to the priesthood, uh, royal priesthood, you know, this is who we are. And kind of tagging it with the bride, uh, the bride Jesus is raising up a bride who is a royal priest, a warrior bride, a, uh, and just all of the, all that goes with a qualified. But I think it's really important today to talk to people about your qualification, because there's so much guilt today. So many people just feel so snowed, so under the weight of guilt mm -hmm. and condemnation, and you're you're a qualified priest. And God's not impressed by hanging back and going, oh, oh, you know, that's, that's not it. He's impressed when we press in. So anyway. Mm -hmm. It's interesting how the, the manna is not hidden, but it's stored yeah. and ready to be poured out. That was, yeah. that was interesting. You know, it's hidden, but it's not. <laughs> I wonder how many times we think that God has hidden something and he's just storing it so that we can press in and take it, mm -hmm. possess it. Yeah. And the key is being in the Holy of Holies. Yeah. You know, the yeah. key to everything. Yeah. <laughs> you know, all the blessings and everything is just being in the Holy of Holies. And yeah. praise God, we have access now through Jesus. Yeah. Right? I mean, that's the whole point. And how, how, how better could God say it than to say, therefore, let us come boldly. Uh, come boldly. I mean, he says, come boldly. He says, those who seek me, you'll be found. When you seek me with all your heart, I will be found of you. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I love that old song, you know, come run and come oh. run. And <laughs> it's wow. such an anointed song. Yeah. To the mercy seat where oh. Jesus oh. is. Uh, yeah. Oh, my goodness. That I get chills just thinking about it. <laughs> I, that song is dripping with anointing. Yeah. 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 It's like to me every time. Every time you've had. Every time we've done a retreat, 
I would always say, well, can't you get somebody to do uh, break every chain? <laughs> you would always say, well, you know, we've, we, we've done it. I said, but do it again. Do it again. <laughs> and then if somebody does it early in the conference, I say, well, could you do it the last day? All right. <laughs> There's some songs that just, that just carry such a th thick, rich anointing. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm. Well. All right, I'm going <laughs> to come in the well, other room. All right, we'll go ahead and celebrate Holy Communion then. And we want to take one more week and uh, talk about some other praise topics. And then, Lord willing, we're going to do a verse by verse study of Matthew. Matthew's going to take some time, though. I, I, found, I find it really enriching to... Uh, uh, study the life of Jesus verse by verse slowly. By the way, you, you know, <laughs> 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 lift our head, sticking in there. In the, I don't know if you can you see that. I don't think they can see it. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's just my it's normal, normal picture. All right. Yeah. On on my screen. <laughs> oh, I see. On my screen, Lynn's head is sticking in the side of the screen, but it's not on your screen. So, <laughs> so anyway. Uh, uh, I think three times I've taught through the Gospel of Matthew. When you go verse by verse slowly, uh, you really get a sense of the heart of Jesus, of the person, mm -hmm. of a living person interacting with people. Uh, so uh, anyway, if we'll be patient, that will take us some time, but we'll get through that. So, well, here we are, and those who may be joining with us later, uh, Let's celebrate together. Father, we thank you that you have done everything you can to depict your desire to tabernacle among us. And we thank you for your invitation to, to come into your presence. And we thank you that you've revealed to us how to do that, how to, to be washed, how to be cleansed, how to be qualified to come into your presence. We thank you for all of the things that are stored up there in your presence. And we just give you thanks and praise today. Mm -hmm. And we thank you especially that you've left us this celebration, Holy Communion, Holy Eucharist. We thank you mm -hmm. that in the hours before the cross, we thank you, Jesus, that you took the bread in your hands and you blessed it. And you said, this is my body uh, given for you. And so, Lord, we bless this bread. We ask that you would anoint it and consecrate it to be more than just bread, that it would be a, a partaking of the life and the presence of Jesus and the substance of Jesus into our lives. And we remember how you blessed the cup, Lord Jesus, and you said, this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And so we bless this cup and we ask, Lord, that you would consecrate it, that it would be to us more than just a remembrance or a representation, but it would be something of the substance of your life imparted to us. That this would be the food of new and unending life in you. We ask you to consecrate us today, Lord, that you'd wash and cleanse and consecrate us to receive these elements in faith and in communion, holy communion with you. And so we take this bread mm -hmm. now, remembering that Jesus said, this is my body given for you, Take and eat. Mm. And we remember how Jesus said, this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink. Mm -hmm. And Lord, we thank you that in the hours following that meal, mm. you did institute a new covenant through the, the gift of your life and the shedding of your blood, you removed anything that would ever separate us from you and from our Father. We thank you for all of the rich blessings that flow from Calvary. We give you thanks and praise and blessing and honor. Most of all, we thank you for this, that we may tabernacle with you, that we may have everlasting fellowship with you. Help us, Lord, to avail ourselves of this invitation day by day, entering into your presence and enjoying fellowship with you.
We ask this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Well.